Hello and welcome back to MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic. In today's video, we are going to update and upgrade our Saskia the Unyielding Creature Tokens Matter EDH deck. <laughs> Thank you for choosing MTG Burgeoning for your Magic the Gathering content. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoy this video and consider becoming a subscriber. Doing so supports the channel and makes you eligible for our various subscriber reward series. If you would like to support the channel further, then click the link to our Patreon page in the description below. There you can join our ongoing Pack Wars series as a one month supporter or ongoing member. Or, try joining Pack Wars for free by commenting on every MTG burgeoning video in a month. We strive to offer creative rewards through our various Patreon tiers. So if Pack Wars isn't for you, then something else will be. Links to our content and various subscriber reward series can be found in the description below. Send us an email, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram. We are your channel for all things magic. Greetings and salutations to the MTGBC! You are the MTG Burgeoning Community. Welcome back to another installment of the Up and Up series. And yes, your minds are not playing tricks on you. Not too long ago, we did feature Saskia the Unyielding on the Up and Up series, and, well, she's back quicker than Superman folds laundry on Laundry Day. We have to make some sweeping changes to this deck because it is slower than a bowl full of molasses, folks. I'm telling you, I'm just sitting there on turn three, turn four, doing absolutely nothing, hoping to try to get some kind of tokens created. Meanwhile, my, meanwhile, my opponents are just swarming me with every single thing they possibly could, and that only makes Saskia even angrier. So we are here to try to figure out the best way to make Saskia Saskia the Unyielding Creature Tokens matter, matter even more. And the best way we can do that is, well, it's the simplest way. We need to reframe our mindset with this deck. If we want a Creature Token deck to be a Saskia build, well, then we have to focus on nothing but Creature Tokens. And with that in mind, we are going to excise... Yes, we are going to get rid of, it is gone, we are going to get rid of the aristocratic theme that we had woven into this deck as a way in which to utilize our creature tokens in ways other than just combat. By doing that, we should be able to reestablish a better tempo to the game, being more interactive in the early parts of the games, creating our tokens, creating a token army, and then having Sasuke the Unyielding lead those tokens into combat for the win. We're going to see how it goes. As stubborn as I am, I will not stop until this Saskia build does what I want it to do. So we're going to begin by taking apart piece by piece our Aristocrats and Death Matters portion of this build in order to supplement it with things that actually make tokens during the first couple turns of the game. With that being said, let us begin stripping down the deck. The first card to come out is going to be Black Market. 3 and 2 black enchantment. Whenever a creature dies, we put a charge counter on this. In the beginning of our pre-combat main phase, we'll add a black mana to our mana pool for each charge counter on black markets. Now, this is not a deck that is built or constructed to destroy tons and tons of our opponent's creatures. Any incidental deaths, of course, are always welcomed as we can put charge counters on this enchantment when any creature hits the yard. More often than not, historically for this deck, it was our own creatures being self-sacrificed that allowed the charge counters on black markets to grow and grow to the point where we can use that black mana to cast a game-ending instant or sorcery remove, I'm sorry, instant or sorcery direct damage or drain life spell. With our shift away from self-sacrificing, for the most part, there will still be some sacrifice effects in the left in the 99 because, well, they're just too good to not include. With the majority of the focus being placed on creature tokens and nothing having to do with a aristocratic package, Black Market is card number one to receive the Heave Ho. 
Replacing black markets is Rith's Charm. At instant speed for Naya Colors, we pick one of the following three modes. We can just straight target non-basic land, which, let's face it, if you're staring across a Gaius Cradle, you want that to go bye-bye. Mode number two is we create three 1-1 one, one green Saperland creature tokens. That is very, very valuable, and that's the reason why this card's going in and taking the spot away from Black Market. For three mana, we get three 1-1s. One, that is great return on our mana investment. And the last mode that we could choose is we prevent all damage a source of our choice would deal this turn. Let's not overlook the potential of what that could do for us, particularly if you're sitting across some decks that, let's say, are just focused on winning through one Commander Swipe. All right, next card that's coming out again, tied to our posthumous aristocratic theme. The Meat Hook Massacre is coming out. This is X and 2 black when it ETBs. Each creature got minus X, minus X till end of turn. When a creature we control died, each opponent would lose a life. And then whenever a creature an opponent controls died, we would gain one life. We would have the Meat Hook Massacre in play, hopefully with the purposes of sacrificing our own tokens and draining our opponent's life. That was never going to work because we were unable to get any sizable number of creature tokens on our side of the battlefield because we were just too slow. Taking the place of the Meat Hook Massacre is Cabaretti Charm. This is our second Naya Charm that we are going to include. And again, we'll pick one of the following three modes. We'll deal damage equal to the number of creatures we control to target creature or planeswalker. If everything works as it should, that number should be quite high. Creatures we control get plus one, plus one, and gain trample until end of turn as mode number two. And again, if these changes have the desired effects of creating more and more creature tokens, we could potentially look at mode number two of Cabaretti Charm as a win condition. And lastly, mode three, we create two 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature tokens. Now, unlike Rith's Charm, we're only getting two creatures for the mana investment of three, but having the first two options as, all, as additional modes, I think we can hedge against only getting two creatures with the investment of three, just because the first two modes are so, so valuable. Card number three coming out is Alenda the Dusk Rose, 1-1 one, one Vampire Knight with lifelink for two and ores off colors. Whenever another creature dies, we would put a plus one plus one counter on Alenda, and then when Alenda dies, we would create X, 1-1 one, one white vampire creature tokens with lifelink, where X was Alenda's power. So again, the, the goal was to sacrifice our tokens putting plus one, plus one counters on Alenda, getting her to be a massive, massive creature, and then sacrifice her to get additional one, one white, white vampire creature tokens. But that's not the case anymore, so Alenda must go way of the dinosaurs. Taking Alenda's spot in this build is called the Copper Coats. Now this is an instant with the Strive mechanic. The first casting of the spell will cost two and a white, and then each time it's going to cost one and a white if we cast it for a target in addition to the first one. So if we pay two and a white, we choose a target opponent and we create X11 one, one white human soldier creature tokens where X is the number of creatures that opponent controls. If we want to add an additional opponent, it'll take one and white, it'll take a, it'll take one and a white mana for each opponent after the first to copy call the copper coats. So if we're sitting down to a table and our opponents have oodles and oodles of creatures in front of them, all we need is some white mana and cast and call the copper coats, and we will be able to fill our board with all kinds of human soldier creature tokens. That is the new goal of this deck, is we want to make creature tokens as quickly and as in a lot of many ways as possible. All right, card number four coming out. It is Korvald, the Fey Cursed King. A 4-4 flying dragon noble for two injunned colors. When an ET bead or attacked, we sacrificed another permanent. And we never minded because they were going to they were going to be our creature tokens. And whenever we sacrificed a permanent, we were gonna put a plus one plus one counter on Korvald and draw a card. Well, we're getting out of the sacrifice game for the most part. Again, not every single outlet is going to be taken out, but with it being dialed back dramatically, it no longer seems 
to it no longer seems to be in the best interest of the deck to keep Corval and its five CMC in the 99. Replacing Corval is Lingering Souls, a sorcery for two and a white. We create two 1-1 one, one white spirit creature tokens with flying. And again, that's only three. I mean, that's a, that's only two creatures with the investment of three mana. But we do have the ability to flash it back for one and a black. So five total mana for four 1-1s one, with evasion. We'll take that every day of the week and twice on Friday Night Magic. All right, so, so far we've included four spells, all three CMC, that are going to help to help us to create tokens. And we've taken out CMC of five, four, five, and X. So in addition to creating more and more tokens, we want to be quicker. We want smaller spells. We want to be more of a factor in the early games because we haven't been since the last Up and Up update. Next card to come out. This one hurts me because I think this creature is so good, particularly in an aristocratic build. But again, we're shying away from that in lieu of other things. So, Requiem Angel, you are out. A 5-5 five, five flyer with for 5 and a white. Whenever another non-spirit creature we control dies, we would create a 1-1 one, one spirit creature token with flying and put that onto the battlefield. Can you imagine the ability to just sacrifice, say, with a goblin bombardment or with an Ashnod's altar, sacrificing a human or sacrificing a goblin? And then Requiem Angel says, well, here, have another 1-1 one, one token. It just wasn't going to work, and it's just another piece of our aristocratic package that has to come out. Taking the spot of Requiem Angel is Forbidden Friendship. It's one in a red sorcery speed. We create a 1-1 one, one red dinosaur creature token with haste and a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. Now, I kind of prioritized when selecting these token spells. I wanted a balance of one mana per one body. And if there were any one mana per one body spells that had any additional attributes to them, like the haste on the dinosaur, then that would trump spells like, um, what is it, Dragon Fodder and Krenko's Command, both sorceries that are one in a red that put two one one goblins into play. Well, this puts two one ones into play, and one of them has haste. So Forbidden Friendship was favored over spells like goblin, like those two goblin spells. All right, next card coming out. Again, another chunk of the aristocratic package comes out. Sir Conrad the Grim. We all know the book on Sir Conrad, one of the most powerful uncommon creatures to ever be created in Magic. It's a 5-4. It's 3-2 and two black, and whenever another creature dies or a creature card is put into the graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield or a creature card leaves our graveyard, Sir Conrad the Grim had dealt one, dealt one damage to each opponent. So imagine in that same scenario that we were talking about with Requiem Angel, we're sacrificing these tokens. They're hitting the graveyard, deal, dealing a point of damage to each of our opponents but no longer. So the aristocratic package continues to take hit after hit. The best part about Sir Conrad, other than the ability to just completely wipe out our opponents, is it has a built-in mill ability. One in a black, each player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. Maybe there will be a time that you can return Sir, return Sir Conrad, but for right now, it's not in the cards. Okay, and to replace Sir Conrad the Grim... We have raised the alarm. It's one and a white at instant speed. We create two 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens. This was favored over spells like Krenko's Command and Dragon Fodder because although it's two mana for two 1-1s, one, the ability to cast it at any time at instant speed trumps the sorcery speed of each of those two spells. Next part of the package to come out, it is Tasa Karloff. Yep. Yeah. I hear you. I'm feeling it too, folks. I'm feeling it too. She's a 2-4 human advisor for two and ores off colors. If a creature dying caused a trigger ability of a permanent we control to trigger, it triggered an additional time. So if we just shift Tesa Karloff to the left a little bit and we look at some of those creatures that we've already taken out, Sir Conrad the Grim would deal two damage to each opponent. Requiem Angel would create two spirit tokens. Corvald would get two plus one plus one counters and we would draw two cards. Alenda would get two plus one plus one counters and create double the tokens when she dies. But if the majority of it is coming out and we no longer have those death triggers, 
taking Tesa Carla off, taking case, taking Tesa Carla off out of the deck makes a lot of sense. Even though creature tokens we control have vigilance and lifelink, maybe perhaps in the future, if we solve the token problem, we could talk about maybe Tesa returning to the 99. Taking her spot as an instant, you see a pair of goblins. So we get to pick one for two and one red mana. We get to pick creatures we control, get plus two, plus zero until end of turn, which, if this deck ends up doing what we want it to do, should and could act as a potential win condition. And then, of course, the other ability, we can create two 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens. Again, the three mana for two bodies is not ideal, but the potential of adding a win condition at instant speed made you see a pair of goblins too good to pass up. Two more parts of the aristocratic package in this subsection of the video to come out, and the next one is Zillaport Cutthroat. When we're talking about death triggers, when we're talking about sacrificing creatures, when we're talking about aristocrats, Zillaport Cutthroat is one of those creatures that's at the top of the list of adding to the 99 of a deck. Whenever it or another creature we control dies, each opponent lost a life, and we would gain a life. But no more. With Zillaport Cutthroat coming out, we are going to put in Garrick, Cursed Huntsman. Now here we have a Planeswalker for four in Golgari colors at ETBs with five loyalty counters on it. We can zero Garrick to create two 2-2 two, two black and green wolf creature tokens with, when this creature dies, we put a loyalty counter on each Garrick we control. Again, we are keeping some of the sacrifice outlets in the 99, so we could, be, we could easily sacrifice one of these wolves to give Garrick some more loyalty. And why will we need that more loyalty? Well, you see as we get to the minus six ability. He also has a minus three ability of destroying a target creature and drawing a card. So we get to interact with the board and put a card in our hand for three loyalty counters. The big one here, minus six, we'll get an emblem that gives our creatures overrun at the beginning of each flip and turn. So creatures we control get plus three, plus three, and have trample, and that never goes away. There's no way to get rid of an emblem. Garrick puts it into play, and all of our tokens are now getting trample, and plus three, plus three. Since we are adopting more of a token build as opposed to an aristocratic theme, replacing Zillaport Cutthroat with Garrick just makes a lot of sense. All right, and now... Viscera Seer, one of the sacrifice outlets that is going to come out of the deck. We sacrifice a creature to scry one. She only costs one black mana and just a 1-1. One, one. Very, very strong. Viscera Seer, you were great while you were relevant, but for the time being, you are out. Viscera Seer is going to be replaced by what we can consider to be a win condition in this deck if we have enough creatures on our side of the battlefield. And that's going to be Jetmir, Nexus of Revels. A 5-4 for just one in Naya Colors. Our creatures are going to get plus one, plus zero, and Vigilance if we have three or more of them. If we have six or more creatures, they'll get plus two, plus zero, Vigilance, and Trample. If we have at least nine creatures, including Jetmir, they get plus three, plus zero, Vigilance, Trample, and Double Strike. If these changes do what they're supposed to, and we are able to create consistent tokens throughout the game, both early, mid, and late, Jetmere Nexus of Revels is going to come down and absolutely wreak havoc on the battlefield. Okay, so... In addition to creating more creature tokens more often, we need to be quicker in the early game. We need to ramp more. We need to get more lands in play. We just have to be faster. So let's be faster by including some of the best ramp spells we can. One in the form of Farseek. Sorcery speed, one in a green. We'll search our library for a plains, island, swamp, or mountain, and we'll put that card onto the battlefield tapped. Target number one for Farseek is always going to be a Triome. 
and the next two cards are going to be showcased at the same time because they are exactly the same. We have Nature's Lore and Three Visits. Each card is one and a green mana at sorcery speed. We search our library for a forest card and put that onto the battlefield. If we are if we are um, ramping up very early in the game, of course, in order to fix our mana, we want to make sure that those are going to target the triumphs that are in this deck. All right, Farseek is going to replace Aetherworks Marvel. Now, Aetherworks Marvel was in this deck based upon the amount of sacrificing and creatures of ours that were going to die, because each time a permanent we controlled was put into the graveyard, we got an energy counter. And then we would tap the Aetherworks Marvel, pay six energy, and then we would look at the six, the top six cards of our library. We would cast one of them without paying its mana cost. However, now that we're taking out so many of the sacrifice outlets and shifting away from our aristocratic theme, Aetherworks Marvel is one of those cards that is just going to be kind of gathering dust on our side of the battlefield, waiting in order for us to get more and more energy. Because again, although we can count on our creature tokens dying, it made a lot more sense to include that artifact in the 99 when we knew that we could do it by our own hands. Another one of our sacrifice outlets to come out, similar to Viscera Seer, this is going to be replaced by Nature's Lore, it's Altar of Dementia. Sacrifice a creature, target player mills a number of cards equal to that creature's power, and it was in here strictly for its ability to act as a sacrifice outlet. Very rarely, if ever, if I can remember, we were able to mill, a, mill an opponent out by sacrificing our tokens to the Altar of Dementia. So... <clears throat> With that in mind, and our aristocratic theme becoming unwoven, it makes sense to have Altar of Dementia be replaced by something that can make the overall deck stronger, and that's going to be one of our two-mana ramp spells. Speaking of two-mana ramp spells, Three Visits is going to replace Bootlegger Stash. Don't get me wrong, this card is a monster. The five and a green is a bit high, particularly in this deck when we're trying to get quicker by including all of these ramp spells. Again, we are trying to maintain earlier tempo, and if we get to the point where we can establish that consistently, then perhaps we can relook in the future to having Bootlegger Stash come back to the 99. Honestly, this card may be a much better fit to the Garth One Eye artifact tokens deck matter EDH deck that we have. Consider seeing this card getting some playtesting time in that deck and perhaps an up and up episode. All right, so we've done the token things. We've done the ramp things. Now let's talk about upgrading and updating this mana base. We are going to take out some of the cards that are no longer going to be relevant in this deck. West, West Vale Abbey, you were in here as a way in which to act as a sacrifice outlet. Tapping five, tapping this, sacrificing five creatures, and then transforming this into the 9-7 menace that is Omen Call, I think his name. Well, we can just transform him and see. And we can do that, and yes, it's Ormondal, the Profane Prince, and 9-7 Flying, Lifelink, Indestructible Haste. And outside of that, we could invest five mana and one life just to create a 1-1 one -one white and black human cleric creature token. That's way too much of an investment into this land. And again, if we're not looking to, to utilize those self-sacrifice abilities, then Westvale Abbey could yield to a land that will give us much better, much better results in the 99 of this deck. Also coming out is Reliquary Tower. We really don't need a Reliquary Tower in this deck. We are not drawing tons and tons of cards. Outside of an ability of one of our opponents or a spell that puts those cards into our hands, Reliquary Tower is taking the spot of a land that can produce actual colored mana, which we really need in a four-colored build. So Reliquary Tower, you are out. Taking the replace of Westvale Abbey and the Reliquary Tower are two of the Streets of New Capenna Triumphs that are both effective for this deck. That's Jetmere's Garden, that gives us red, green, or white mana, and Zeotora's Proving Ground, which gives us black, red, or green mana. These can both be put onto the battlefield with Farseek, Nature's Lore, or Three Visits, and they are a wonderful early turn target as a way in which to fix our mana. 
And you can see if we're moving more towards casting some spells and creating more of a board presence with our token with our tokens, then getting rid of two cards that or getting rid of two lands that only give us colorless mana is a great way to do so. And the last little change here to the mana base, little change I say, coming out is mana confluence. Now this would give us one mana of any color, but it would cost us a life to do so. So if I'm talking about all of the ways in which we need to straighten out the mana and fix the mana so that we can cast the spells that we need, why would I take out a card that gives us one mana of any color and it costs us one life each time? Well, because a better addition became available. Reflecting Pool, under the greatest of circumstances, will act as Command Tower number 2, which will be so much better than Mana Confluence because it'll give us one mana of any color we need, and we won't have to pay the one life. All right, back to the mana base. Now, this one isn't a small change. It's a big change, but it's going to help this deck immensely. Prior to this update, this deck ran every possible check land that it could. There were six of them, and they're all right here. The Dragon Skull Summit, the Rootbound Crag, the Sun Petal Grove, the Isolated Chapel, Clifftop Retreat, and the Woodland Cemetery. Now, this, these six check lands, each of them would enter the battlefield untapped if each of the lands saw the appropriate basic land type. For, for Dragon Skull Summit, if we had a swamp or a mountain, it would come into play untapped. Well, we're in a four-color build, and the check lands have proven to be very spotty from a consistency standpoint. More times than not, especially without including the two new Streets of New Campena Triumphs in this update, these bad boys were coming into play tapped and severely hampering our already disjointed tempo. So with that in mind, these six check lands are going to come out. All six of them are out. And these six check lands are going to be replaced by lands that are going to be much better overall for this build. And those are the six appropriately themed slow lands. We have Haunted Ridge, Rockfall Vale, Overgrown Farmland, Shattered Sanctum, Sundown Pass, and Death Cap Glade. Now, each of these are the exact same colors that are provided by the six check lands, but they come into play tapped only if we control less than two other lands. So by turn three, if we go land, land, any other time we draw one of these slow lands, they go right onto the battlefield untapped, making sure that we can cast them and make sure that we can cast our spells the turn that they come into play without fear of them being tapped by like some of these check lands have proven to happen too many times in the past. So that is a massive upgrade overall to the land base because we're getting quicker, we're getting more fixing to our mana, and we're getting rampier with those three spells. Speaking of rampier, the very last card we're going to include in the Saskia build, we're going to throw a mana crypt in here. Now, of course, this is not going to help us power out Saskia because Saskia is just one mana of the four colors in the stack. If we get a turn one mana crypt, it is a very, very good chance that we could cast one of our one of our token creating spells on turn one and really start to take control of the game on the very first turn. Now, granted, the three points of damage that could happen, well, that's just part of having one of the most powerful artifacts in the game in this deck for zero mana. Again, the occasional loss of a coin flip will be inconsequential to dropping something amazing on turn one and then being so far ahead of our opponents from a resource from a res from a resource perspective that we should be able to outpace them throughout the early to mid portions of the game. Mana Crypt is going to go in and it's going to take the place of Exsanguinate. So Exsanguinate is, was one of our big mana game-ending spells because X and two black, each opponent loses X life, and we gain life equal to the life lost this way. Now, again, when we were sacrificing creatures regularly, sometimes to Ashnod's Altar, sometimes to um, the Phyrexian Altar, and when we were also using that black mana from Black Market, having an oodles and oodles of life drain spells as win conditions in the deck seemed like a really good idea. But again, we're steering away from that and trying to focus more on creating, cultivating, and enhancing a token army. 
And with that in mind, we have to slightly weaken our other win conditions. Now, we still have Debt to the Deathless in the 99, which, once X reaches 6, is a far superior spell than Exsanguinate. And we also still have Comet Storm, too. We still have our Gaius Cradle and our Growing Rights to Itlamok. So we still have the ability to get those big mana spells, but in order to accommodate the our desire to be quicker to get higher tempo and to be more of a threat in the early game, we have to slightly weaken one of the other areas of strength so that we can do that. That is why Exsanguinate is out and Mana Crypt is in. And there we have it, MTGBC. Saskia the Unyielding has had another appearance on the Up and Up series. Hopefully this time the changes will stick and the next time you see her will be when she enters into the Burgeoning Commander Catalog. Let me know your thoughts about these changes, as well as the new avenue that the deck is taking, in the comments section below. This is MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic.